So again, welcome, welcome. This morning, we're going to talk a bit about the, a book called Outlive, The Science and Art of Longevity by Dr. Peter Atia, who's originally Canadian. He spent most of his life in the U.S., uh, but he ha has started out at the U of T, I believe. Um, a few people have mentioned he has a lot of information about longevity, and uh, he, he really researches his, his uh, information well. So the book uh, is quite long and extensive. It is worth a read, but I'm giving you a bit of the Coles notes. So if you have questions as we go through, as I mentioned, I'd love this for, for this to be more of a discussion. So if you disagree with something or you agree with it, or you, you have information that you wanna share based on your personal um, experience, or um, based on something that you've read, please do feel free to unmute yourself and, and chat about it or uh, into the chat. I'll, uh, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. So I think a lot of you know Vintage Fitness. We, um, we only work with older adults, so we're really quite specialized. Clients do achieve their health goals with us, but it tends to be slow and steady. We make small changes that can transform people's lives over time. And it was started in 2005. So we've been going for about 18 years now. So in today's session, the key things we're going to learn are, you know, how do you improve your quality of life as you age, as we age, and which chronological diseases are the most prevalent? Uh, what's the latest research saying about the chronological diseases and how to prevent them? Um, we're also going to get uh, into exercise. So which exercises are best for you to be doing it for longevity? So most it's really focused on the book. Um, if you if we ask questions as we go through, uh, Sid and I can use some of our knowledge to help answer that as well. But uh, but this is really focused on the Outlive um, book. So a bit about me, if I don't know you, um, uh, again, I've been running Vintage Fitness for 18 years, a couple of degrees in biology from the University of Guelph, and then an MBA from McMaster University. Uh, I'm a personal trainer and an older adult fitness specialist. And again, I'm Erin. So the book is 17 chapters. It's 416 pages. And the first little bit goes into health issues. So kind of setting up the, the problems or the issues. The second bit talks about frameworks and principles to act on. And it's really that uh, Dr. Atia talks about wanting to learn, teach you how to think, not specific action plans as to what to do, which is quite different for a health and wellness book. Most of the time it's like, take out gluten, take out dairy, you know, it's some specific thing, um, action plan that it's, it's getting you to do. This is much more complicated, uh, but I think it gives a pretty good um, broad spectrum on what's, uh, what's happening with longevity. Doesn't try to oversimplify. So the concept that Dr. T is going to talk about, and I, I'm going to play this clip from him in a minute, but he talks about health span as opposed to chronological age. So really extending quality of life, which is he's calling your health span as opposed to just your chronological age. All right, let me play this. And Sid, just maybe give me a thumbs up if uh, you can hear it okay. I want to talk about a graphical way that we can represent longevity. And the way that we can do it most easily is to consider the two age dependent drivers of health span, cognition and physical performance on the vertical axis here, while considering lifespan on the horizontal axis here. So let's start by turning our attention to the white line. The white line represents what happens without much of an intervention as a person ages? So a person is born here at time zero. And if you follow the trajectory of their graph, what's happening is as it's moving to the right, you're gaining chronologic years. And as it's coming down, the quality of your life is declining, such that when the line crosses the horizontal axis, a person is literally dead. The blue line represents what I believe the best medicine has to offer, which is to say, initially, it really follows the same curve as the white line. But just as you're about to near the end of life, it comes in and manages to delay death by some period of time. 
using amazing and heroic tools of medicine, it manages to postpone death by potentially a few years or more, but often without any improvement in the quality of life. Finally, I'd like you to imagine the red line. The red line you can see increases the length of life, though not logarithmically. It certainly isn't a science fiction extension of life. What most stands out in the red line is the way in which it reduces the decline of health span and compresses the period of decline. One way that I like to think about this is to ask the question, how much of a person's life is spent below about the 50th percentile quality of life? So if you think about this being 100% of the quality of life and this being about 50%, Very important metric to me is how big this gap is. That's the period of time that a person spends beneath about that 50% window in which their quality of life is really reduced. The red one is where we want to be, not just because you're living longer, but because you're spending a far narrower fraction of your life in the final stages of decline. This is what it means to square the longevity curve. In an ideal world, that red curve would be a straight line here that would drop vertically and instantaneously at the end of a person's life. Your curve is not set in stone. This is a malleable process. Now, it's not going to be malleable based on one pill, one magic workout, one fruit smoothie shake, or any such elixir. It's going to come down to a lot of hard work, a lot of understanding, a lot of sacrifice, and a lot of strategy. And while such a longevity curve represents a theoretical aspiration that can probably never be attained, it serves as a model for what we can aspire to. Okay, so um, I, I like his his approach, and all of us want that. All of us want to live well for as long as we can, and then just croak at the very end. Right? We don't want this like long, lingering, unwell phase. Um, one of the things that uh, is considered in this Outlive book is what can we live, learn from people that are over a hundred years old. Um, a lot of them are have have lucky genes. So they have more longevity genes than most. So there's a specific gene called <clears throat> APOE, which is involved in cholesterol transport and processing. Um, a lot of centurions have <clears throat> more of this gene. And uh, it also may pl pay, play a role in delaying or not delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. But don't think that there's like one magic gene. It could be hundreds of longevity genes in, a, a com in combination. So there's no magic bullet. Um, or ideal uh, centurion genome. But before you kind of, uh, oh, woe is me, I, I, I didn't draw well in the genetic pool, I have the wrong parents. Um, gene expression can be influenced by your environment quite strongly in your behaviors. <clears throat> One uh, expression that I heard at a conference last summer was uh, genetics loads the gun and uh, lifestyle pulls the trigger. So if you are not genetically lucky, <clears throat> that sucks, but you can influence if a gene uh, gets expressed or not to some extent. Um, there was a 2007 study that looked at older people who exercised and were able to shift their gene expression after about six months. This would be fairly intensive exercise. We're, we're probably not talking a 20 minute walk a day. Like this is, you have to think about this as being <clears throat> probably a change to your lifestyle for, for most of us. Their superpower of centurions is really their ability to resist or delay the onset of chronic disease. <clears throat> and the reason I think is important because it's frustrating when you hear stories of like a 110 year old and she smokes a pack a day and she does, you know, they always seem to pull out the bad lifestyle things. And so it's easy for people to think, throw up their hands and be like, 
well, you know, it's just, she's got good genes. Well, there's more to the story than that. Uh, the other thing to learn from centarians is caloric reduction uh, may help to increase metabolic efficiency. So how efficient your cells are um, at doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the nutritional front. Never popular when we talk about caloric reduction, but <laughs> okay. And as I say, feel, feel free to <clears throat> ask questions as we go through or, or uh, write in the chat. So one of the questions posed in this group, in this book, Outlive, is our current medical approach on the graph that Dr. T was showing us that medicine 2.0, is it reducing mortality over time? So hopefully this graph is somewhat clear. On the vertical axis is mortality rate. On the horizontal axis is years. So it runs from 1900 up to 2000. And if you look at the black line, it shows overall mortality rate. So this is a health crisis here. I don't know, this is a plague or something. I'm not sure what this is. And then you go down. So you see a good reduction in mortality rate over time. The white line is stripping out infectious disease, which was well controlled by antibiotics and um, vaccines. So if you pull that, that factor out, the line's looking a bit less convincing. So how well has... Um, modern medicine decrease mortality for things other than our infectious diseases is, is the challenge here. And I'm happy to sort of talk about that. Um, the Most of us will die from what Dr. Tia calls the four horsemen, which are heart disease, cancer, neurological disease, and type two diabetes. And this, these are arguably maybe where the current medical system and our current lifestyles are not helping. Uh, in, in terms of improving our quality of life. Here's uh, Dr. T again, a little bit with a bit more information about the four horsemen. So if you want to live longer, the mathematical equivalent function is delay the onset of chronic disease, not figure out ways to live longer once you have chronic disease. It's worth noting that unfortunately, the entire healthcare system is mostly geared towards the opposite. Prevention is not really the mainstay of medicine. Medicine has had its greatest impacts or its greatest efforts basically on what to do once you have a disease, how do you live longer? So double clicking on this idea a little bit, we say, okay, well, now that you've accepted the idea that we're going to delay the onset of chronic disease in as much as we want to live longer, what are the major pillars of chronic disease? And they are basically four things. I think of them as sort of three disease processes and then one sort of overarching principle. So the three main disease pillars are atherosclerotic disease, so cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, cancer, and neurodegenerative disease, of which Alzheimer's disease is the most common. And then when you add the fourth, which is kind of the foundational disease, which is really a spectrum of everything that goes from hyperinsulinemia to insulin resistance to fatty liver disease to type 2 diabetes. I consider that kind of one big spectrum. That effectively becomes the foundation upon which these others exist. And so, as you know, in the book, we refer to those as the four horsemen of disease, the four horsemen of chronic disease. And so when you look at those four things, the spectrum of everything from hyperinsulinemia to type 2 diabetes, the atherosclerotic diseases, cancer, and the neurodegenerative diseases, that amounts to a little over 80% of deaths in people over 50 who do not smoke. So that's non-trivial. And in fact, in the spirit of starting with the 80-20 principle, that's really where we want to focus most of our efforts. The other side of this coin, which is the health span side, comes down to these three pieces, the cognitive piece, the physical or structural piece, and the emotional piece. And the good news here is you get one really easy one for free, which is the cognitive piece. So most of the efforts we put into preserving cognition are basically directly in line with the efforts we will make to reduce the risk of dementia. 
So if you're sort of picturing me on a whiteboard, the way I'd be explaining this is on the left-hand side, I'd have longevity, uh, pardon me, lifespan, and I'd have these four horsemen. And then on the other side, I'd have health span, and I'd list these three things out, and there'd be a big solid line between dementia and cognitive preservation because they are so lockstep. So everything you're doing on one, you're basically getting the benefit on the other. The second one is the physical exoskeleton. And this is, I think, for many people, the first one that really starts to compromise quality of life, at least in my experience. For most people, it's the knee pain, back pain, hip pain, neck pain, that is the first thing that really starts to encroach on quality of life. And it occurs decades before a person takes their final breath. And as you know, that's one of the things I'm so maniacally obsessed with. There's no time that's too soon to start caring about that, right? You could be, we have patients that are in their 30s who have no medical problems to speak of, and yet we are really hunkered down on trying to make sure that when they're in their 80s and 90s, they have the physical body of someone who's in their 50s or 60s. And then lastly, the emotional front, this seems to be the one that is by far least tethered to age. And I think for the purpose of simplicity today, I'm not going to go into that one because it doesn't really factor as profoundly as the labs. So the question then is, how much do labs inform each of those things? Again, the four horsemen and call it the exoskeleton. So because again, cognition, you're getting sort of on the same dimension. So then the next thing I would talk about with a patient is, sort of double clicking on what drives risk reduction in each of those things. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek. So. Okay. So how do you know, one of the things that was discussed there was your metabolic health. Um, how do you know what your metabolic health is? So some markers of poor met metabolic health, you'll probably be familiar with. And if you don't know these numbers, you should get them. Um, so your blood pressure, so someone that has a high blood pressure over 130 over 85, high triglycerides, so again, over um, 150 milligrams per deciliter, low um, HDL cholesterol, and um, waist circumference. So this would be measured at the belly button, and over 40 inches for men and over 35 inches for women would could be an indicator of poor metabolic health and then elevated fasting glucose. So this would be most people often will, have, you know, that test that you go into the labs and you can't eat anything before the test and you're starving and then they take, that's that test. Um, there's also a lot of um, continuous glucose monitoring. That's a bit of a trend right now um, where you can wear uh, something on your, uh, on your arm. It's, it's not injected right in and you could wear it for um, a certain amount of time and you can actually track how certain foods impact your glucose. You want to try to keep your glucose as steady as you can, as opposed to having big leaps uh, in your glucose it can be hard on your, on your metabolism. Is that making sense so far? Those metrics? Yep. Yeah. You can go with, yep. Um, so this is the, uh, the graph. I, I wanted to show it and making sure that everyone sort of understood it. The graph that Dr. Atia showed. So again, health span is the quality of life. And lifespan is just the chronological age. Um, with no intervention, you're, you're going down this, this one path. A little, the current medicine, you're on this middle line and you extend the length of life, but probably not the quality of life that much. But some of the changes that, that he's recommending, um, and there's, there's no magic on a pill. This is stuff that you've heard of before. It's probably, I might sense from reading the book is just the intensity and the exercise side is a lot more than you might be used to. Was there any questions on this curve or concerns? I think what's important to point out is Med 2.0 is what he refers to as the way medicine handles the issues that we face right now, it's sort of repair it after it's happened. And he's proposing Med 3.0, which means doing something way back when you're younger to prevent these things from happening. So it's it's the the pre pre uh, stuff that that medicine isn't really focusing on very much right now. But he he would propose that uh, the medical business does do work that helps to prevent things before they happen rather than fix them after they happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this would be for 
younger in life, but it can make a difference at any, any age. And we do see this. I see this in my work all of the time. Exercise and nutrition, you probably won't be surprised, are really the keys to a long health span. And depending on how you answer these questions in terms of the, the way this book is written out is, is going to change what your um, suggested solution is. So Dr. Atia will talk to his patients and figure out if they're overnourished or undernourished. Um, you know, how are they taking in too few or too many calories? Are they under muscles or adequately muscled? And are they metabolically healthy or not? So the, the one I think that isn't discussed that much, and, and we don't talk to our clients too much about it, is the metabolic health. Obviously, certain of those metrics we talk about, but it's a, I, like, I like thinking it through undernourished, overnourished, under muscled or adequately muscled, and metabolically healthy. Okay. All right. Thanks, Barbara. You're right. We got 3.0 does sound pretty good. So music to my ears as I'm reading this book and uh, is that exercise is critical. It's the most critical one for health span. Fairly minimal exercise can lengthen your life by several years. This again is in and around page 218 of the book. Exercise delays the onset of many of these chronic diseases, these four horsemen that we've talked about. Exercise can reverse physical and cognitive decline. Uh, it can benefit emotional health and it can improve our ability to metabolize glucose and fat, which is that metabolic health we're talking about. Um, so it, it is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, some specific research uh, is listed underneath. So going from zero weekly exercises to just 90 minutes per week can reduce your risk of dying by all, all causes uh, by 14%. And um, study after study has found that regular exercisers live as much as a decade longer than sedentary people. So it is, if you're looking for a magic um, pill to help with longevity and quality of life, it is exercise, like hands down across, like the crossword is good. But if, if I had to decide between, are you, you know, my clients sit down and do a crossword or go for a walk, it's go for a walk, <laughs> just uh, to be clear. Um, so Dr. Atia breaks exercises into three categories. You'll be familiar with the category. So essentially aerobic endurance, so cardio, um, strength, and stability. Aerobic endurance, um, he breaks out into two different um, intensities of working. The first one is zone two, which, which would build your VO2 max, which is essentially your ability to take in oxygen. Um, Oh, we got someone coming in here. And that is, it's a, an easy way to know whether you're in zone two when you're exercising cardiovascularly is the talk test. So you can have a conversation, but it's a little difficult. You're not going to be talking about philosophy for hours on end. So you're a bit puffy, um, but you're able to have a conversation. That is the best way to train zone two. And I'd say most younger athletes, especially uh, don't like to train in this zone too much because it's actually fairly minimal um, amount of effort for, for an athlete. Um, so, th th you know, if you have younger people in your life and, and you're talking to them about, they you know, they're doing these high intensity efforts all the time, there's a place for those. But most of the time, and he's suggesting um, a couple of hours a week, we should be in this uh, zone two cardiovascular zone. The other is maximal maximal efforts. So this is really pushing um, our, our VO2 max and doing some intervals. You would do that if you have a heart condition or you have other conditions that you're concerned about, you do that, you know, with medical uh, help, you know, to make sure that that's safe for you. But essentially, it's just pushing, um, pushing your heart rate a little bit longer. So this could be an interval walk, it could be uh, intervals on a stationary bike, but something that you're getting really quite puffy and you're not doing it for a very long time. You might do, you know, like a 20 second interval with a 20 second rest and maybe you do that four or five times. So it's not a big, uh, a big long thing, but it's really just pushing your heart rate up um, a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, strength. So you want to train all major muscles three to four times a week. And uh, there's specific things like hip hinging that are really critical in heat. There's a bunch of videos. I'll show you one, but there's quite a few videos. I'll send the links to where you can follow along. Um, 
the thing that it, it, and people often do with exercises is they go right in for the strength and the cardio without doing proper stability. And what stability exercises allow you to do is avoid injury. So you're essentially making sure that the framework you're working on is stable enough so that when you start to lift heavy weights and you should be, um, you're not going to hurt yourself because what happens is people, uh, exercise, exercise, they lift heavy, they get injured, and then it all kind of goes down from there. Okay, so individual exercise programs should link to your goal. So, you know, you all exercise programs should have those components that, you know, the um, cardio, the strength and stability slash balance, that should be in every, every exercise program and quite a bit of it. We'll get into frequency in a minute. But the way that Dr. Atia talks about it, I quite like. So if you want to hike for an hour in your 90s, what do you have to be able to do in your 70s? Because if you can't do it in your 70s and you have it in your 90s, then you you know you got to build that base up and build more because you're going to decline about 10% every decade in your strength and your stamina. So you need to work backwards. So I'm 50. If I want to be able to hike in my 90s, I almost need to be in close to elite level for my cardio so that I can manage that decline. So by the time I'm in my 90s, I'm hiking. So you really have to think about getting average for your age is not what we're going for here. You want to be at the high end, you know, high, high average or elite for your age so that you can manage the, the eventual decline that all of us will have as we get a little bit older. So here's some examples, um, walking up the stairs without stopping or getting winded when you're 80, lifting your pet or grand grandchild up. There's going to be slight, depending on the goal, the program's going to look a bit different. There might be a little bit more strength training for the pet or grandchild and the walking tour on uneven surfaces in Europe. Well, there could be a bit more stability focus there. So it's just about where the focus comes in. Getting off the floor, that would be a big strength uh, in focus on that one, but you'd still do your cardio. Play pickleball in your 80s. Well, there might be a more agility that comes in if that's really what you want to be able to do. So I think um, it's it's neat to think about what are those goals and then how do I train for them? So if I want to do these things in my 90s, that's great. What do I need to be doing now to make sure I can do these things in my 90s, 80s, 70s, whatever your goal is? <clears throat> and if you have some of those goals, I'd love to hear about them. You dro drop them into the chat. So I thought it might be helpful for, for this is my, so this isn't uh, Dr. Tia's uh, suggestion. This would be my sample exercise program. If I was working and, and walking tour in Europe, that uneven ground, this is a big set of stairs. Um, what kind of things would I ask people to do? Depending on where they're starting from, of course, but I sort of went aggressive on this to show that <clears throat> The, the exercise piece for medicine 3.0 is more than you're probably doing, I would say. So I might ask them two 45 minute walks per week in zone two, that talk test piece. Um, there might be modifications. If someone has knee pain, I put them on a stationary a recumbent bike. Like we'd modify depending on what's happening with the person. Uh, or if someone has poor posture, I probably wouldn't put them on a bike. I might, you know, put them in the pool. If someone has bad bone density, I wouldn't put them in the pool. So there is, uh, you know, some modifications. One interval stationary bike ride per week to increase your VO2 max. So that's the one where I do intervals to kind of get you more puffed and really push your cardiovascular reserve. Uh, and I would do two stability and balance training sessions per week and two strength training sessions per week with a focus on leg strength. If you look at those stairs, as an example, you need a lot of strength and stability to get up those stairs. So think aggressive on your goals. <clears throat> Any questions on that? plan or thoughts <laughs> yes thank you shirav as the saying goes it's not the amount of breaths but the moments that take our breath away this is achieved by good quality of life yeah absolutely thank you for sharing that so this is an example and we can do this together of stability exercise so it's when when I think about balance exercise, I'm thinking about are you balanced standing on two feet? Are you balanced on one foot? Can you can you walk on an uneven surface? This is a bit more around is your um, center cone uh, stable? So not just your core, but the whole kind of all the way down. So this is a, a scapular training exercise. And one of the things to note is you really have to observe what's happening. You can't you're just not just whacking weights around and kind of 
you want to think about um are, are my shoulders uneven what's happening with my breathing so i will play this and let's do it together you can do it sitting is is why i showed this one so scapular training let's do it together So this is one of our favorites, SCAP CARS. CARS stands for Controlled Articular Rotations. It's from Functional Range Conditioning. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to make the biggest circle with a certain joint without moving anything else. So it's great for control. Um, we particularly love this, the scapula CARS uh, because scapular movement changes the positioning of the rib cage, uh, which can impact breathing and can impact weight shifting. It also supports shoulder movement. So these are kind of a big deal. We're gonna start really basic. I would encourage you to also start really basic and then make them more interesting as you go along. So he's gonna bring his arms down by his side. It's always easier to do this stuff seated. He's gonna take his shoulder blades up towards his ears. That's elevation. He's gonna hold that elevation as he brings his shoulder blades back for retraction. So they're up and back. He's gonna slide them down towards his back pockets. He's gonna keep them down in depression as he spreads them wide into protraction. So we're gonna start in a square because circles are hard. So he's gonna go up, back, down, and forward. And once that gets easy, he's going to start making it more of a circle. You'll notice his elbows are staying really straight. You'll see that they'll want to bend. His head is staying nice and still. His spine is staying still. His ribs are moving, but not because he's initiating the movement from his ribs, but his shoulder blades are moving his ribs. Now we're going to reverse this. So they go forward, down, back, and up, protraction, depression, retraction, and elevation. Just do one more like that. You wanna be able to move on your absolute in ranges, but also have a nice consistency and speed as you're getting there. So the next level, he's gonna reach his arms straight forward. Now, when the arms are out, you'll see that they're wanting to do a lot of things to make up for the lack of scap movement. The arms should stay relatively in the same spot. It is going to move, but only because the shoulder blade is moving it. So we're gonna do the same thing starting in a square, up, back into retraction, depression, protraction. Once that gets easy, he can make it a little more smooth. And you'll notice his arms are moving, but he's not initiating the movement with his arms. He's initiating it with his shoulder blades. Good. Go ahead and reverse. Can you feel what's happening to your rib cage as you change? Yeah. These are kind of a big deal. We don't think about it. We never think about our shoulder blades. But for shoulder health, even lower back health, these are important. Good. You want to show them close, Jane? So that's called open chain because there's nothing opposing my hands. A closed chain exercise is more difficult. I don't know. It probably took me a couple of months, I think, to go from being able to do that pretty easily to being able to do this easily. Um, this is a harder position, so I wouldn't really even try this until you're comfortable there. And, and you know, you might find you also need to videotape yourself doing this without your shirt on uh, just to actually see what's happening and make sure that what you think you're doing, you are actually doing. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback on that, when your hands are locked into place, any way that you might have been accommodating the movement before is going to be super highlighted here. So it could be very confusing because you, you're like, mm, I'm doing it the way I've been doing it, but it's not happening. Um, so just be aware of that. So he's going to do the same action here. We're going to start with retraction. So he's going to keep his elbows straight. He's going to retract. So bring them together. Your rib cage will go down. Mm -hmm. So you see his rib cage drops down. He's going to take them forward towards his ears. He's going to keep them forward towards his ears as he pushes up into protraction. And then he'll slide them into his back pockets. So again, retraction, elevation, protraction, and depression. And once he's got it, he can kind of smooth it out 
And in the beginning, your head's going to want to do a lot. Your lumbar spine is going to want to do a lot. Your mid spine is going to want to do a lot. Elbows are also, they may want to bend. So it's just good to be aware of all of those things. So filming yourself is helpful. Go ahead and reverse it. Now, if you're doing any kind of pressing in any direction or pulling, these are a must. Let's do one more. Those are getting pretty good. Yeah, and as you said, one of the things I noticed over time is it would hurt a lot less in my mid back. Mm -hmm. In other words, now when I do it, if I'm done, I don't feel anything and there's no discomfort. It's not like I put my mid back. Uh, yeah, so that just gives you there. There's lots of examples of stability exercises, but I showed that one partly because we can do it seated together, partly to show you, first of all, it's relatively easy. So you could do it, you know, kind of when you're sitting and also the precision. So it's not, okay, good. It's up, stop, pull back. You're really focusing on it to make sure you're not flaring your ribs, doing something funny with your neck. So really paying attention is important. Okay, nutrition. <clears throat> Again, this is a 400 page book. <laughs> so there's a whole chapter on nutrition. And if you're really if you're um, wanting to, to know more, I ended up combination of listening to this book and reading the paper copy of it. So yeah, um, that was a good strategy for me, I found. But the summary <clears throat> of the nutrition piece is there's no magic diet. So there isn't like keto is best or time restricted eating is best or vegetarian or vegan. You know, the, the, the summary is that calorie restriction could may be needed if the meta, your metabolic health is not good. So the metabolic indicators that we looked at earlier, um, your blood pressure, your triglycerides, your waist circumference, if, if there's an issue there, you may have to look at a caloric restriction. And they, they fall into <clears throat> three different categories. One is just food logging. So just eating less in general, paying attention to your calories, um, dietary restriction. So people will sometimes eat less of a particular food. So this is when people go off the dairy or gluten. Uh, I'd recommend if you're going to do dietary restriction, uh, no added sugar, go off sugar, especially like fruit to, fructose drinks, juices with lots of fructose, just eat, eat the piece of fruit. Don't, uh, don't drink the juice, I would say. Um, and then the third is time restricted. So this is where people decide that they're going to eat in certain windows <clears throat> of time. So sometimes people don't eat until 12 and they eat from 12 to seven or whatever the case. There's like a million different permutations and combinations. Um, the book does talk quite a bit about fasting. And I think Dr. T has gone back and forth on fasting. He used to be a big supporter of it. And now he realizes that the impact of fasting, um, it, it can be relevant for certain situations when metabolic health is really poor and someone can't stick to one of the other formats of, of reducing calories. But there is a risk of losing lean muscle mass if you're fasting too often. And so it's all about balance. So it could be part of the strategy, but he's not as big uh, of a supporter of it as he, as he has been in the past. Um, but for us sitting here, I think the biggest nutrition piece we should take is protein. Eating enough protein is critical as we age. So one of the studies that they talk about in the book is uh, looking at B weight training for with seniors and at adding in increased protein intake. And this was a whey protein shake that they added in. And it really helped to increase lean muscle mass over the people that were just doing the weight training. So you really have to think about how much protein are you taking in? Um, is it enough? So he is recommending 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of protein. So if you're, for example, 60 kilos or 132 pounds, you would need 96 grams of protein per day. So an egg, to give you an indicator, has about 13. So for a lot of us, that probably means uh, some supplementation. Um, I would recommend a high quality whey protein over a soy protein. If you're a vegan, you can do a soy protein. It's just not as bioavailable. It's not as easy for your um, body to access as a whey protein. 
So it's worth you thinking, doing the calculation of, okay, well, what is your current weight? What is that in kilograms timed up by 1.6 to get a sense of about how much protein you're taking in. And then, you know, maybe for tomorrow, you have a look at some nutrition labels to see how much protein um, is in the, the things that you're looking at or, or doing some research on it. So, cause an egg is a great source of protein. So yeah, protein. Okay. Sleep again, there's a whole, uh, uh chapter on sleep and how imperative it is for longevity. So chronic inadequate sleep, you know, higher risk for things like dementia, depression, learning and memory problems, heart disease. I mean, it just keeps going high blood pressure, weight gain, diabetes. So it's really important that you try to get enough sleep. Um, it, it also will affect, um, alertness and, and safety for things like driving and stuff. If you're driving, when you, you haven't gotten enough sleep, seniors don't need less sleep than younger people. That that's sometimes what people tell me including my mother, I don't need as much sleep. It's not true. You do need as much sleep as a senior. Um, and sleep, there's something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is essentially, think of it as a street sweeper for your brain. It comes in when you sleep and clears out the, the garbage that's in there, some of the stuff that gets built up. So if you're not getting enough sleep, you're not getting that clean out of this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So really, really important. And about... Um, you know, the research is a bit all over the place on this, but uh, about seven and a half to eight hours is, is suggested um, as the right amount of sleep. <clears throat> so the key takeaways, just have a look at the chat, is help hemp protein bioavailable. Good question. I'm not sure. I, I'd have to look that up, Karen, but I'll look it up and uh, and I'll put it in the summary. My guess is because it's again, plant-based, plant-based proteins tend to be less bioavailable um, because the animal-based proteins, the animal has kind of done part of the job of protein digestion for you a little bit it, you know, in meat and things like that. So that's why it's just easier for our bodies to access. So my guess is it's not, but uh, I will look it up and I will uh, get that back to you. So the key takeaways for, for this book, I would say, um, is think of the quality of your final years, your health span, as opposed to chronological age. Exercise is absolutely critical. So it's the most important thing. If, if you're feeling stressed or not sure or confused, exercise. That's, that's the most important thing. And almost any kind is better than, than nothing. But if you want to be playing pickleball when you're 90, you're going to have to be doing quite a bit right now. Um, my guess is, and because I know a lot of you and I've been in this field for a long time, you probably need to do more and or different exercises than you're currently doing. Um, you want to get to know your metabolic health. So those indicators that I talked about, if you don't know them, you know, book in with your, with your doctor, talk to your doctor about it in your next appointment. Or if you do scans like, you know, Cleveland Clinic or MedCan, um, the, some of those numbers would be available. So have a look at those, at that information. Calculate how much daily protein you need and read labels for a week to see if you're getting enough. And sleep is really important. So plan to get seven and a half to eight hours a night. And again, if, if, if that sleep is an issue for you, there is a bit, whole section on, on sleep. Um, the top tip he has, if you have a hard time sleeping, or especially if you um, wake up, you know, you fall asleep, then you wake up at three is cut out alcohol. It, it will have the bigger, the biggest impact, according to, to Dr. Tia on sleep. So again, this is our information. If you want help uh, developing and uh, getting a program for your centenarian, uh, centenarian goals and um, any questions. Excellent session. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, any questions about this or did I sell anyone to buy the book? I don't, I, dig, I, I get no, no benefit for people buying the book or not. <laughs> Aaron, this is uh, Shivraj. Hello. Hi. Uh, just wanted to comment on the session itself. It was uh, awesome. The way you summarize such a complex <laughs> you know, topic. Uh, one of the things that I feel uh, that's happening in our country is that, uh, you know, for some reason, we, have, we do need that 3.0. Uh, we've passed the stage where majority of the people are already in one of those four horsemen kind of conditions, right? Uh, they're either going through 
heart disease, cancer, neurological, or type 2 diabetes. Of course, type 2, which is the foundational thing, is what's climbing steadily these days. And of course, lifestyle plays a, a huge role. Uh, my uh, comment there is that apart from lifestyle, which is the movement and the what you put in, the eating, uh, the other two areas that hadn't been really uh, touched upon, uh, but I, I believe a positive outlook is highly essential for healthy living. And last but not least, that connectivity, uh, that social connectivity is totally uh, a vital factor in uh, a person's health span, you know, uh, uh, quality of life and longevity. Uh, I just wanted to put it out there. That's yeah, it. yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful. Because the other um, area that, and I didn't talk about it too much, uh, which is in the book, is emotional health. Right. And it's absolutely right. So uh, your outlook is going to make it a huge, huge difference, um, as is your social connectivity. And if you look at the blue zones, all the, the work with blue people that are longest living, those things come up as key areas as well. So thank you for adding that in. That's absolutely um, true. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, so Susan, have you have your hand up there? I don't know if you meant to put your hand up. Your virtual hand. I, I do. I do a lot of exercising and weights and all those kinds of things. But I'm curious about pickleball because it's something that I haven't tried. And what do you see as the advantages of adding it to a program? Oh, I mean, I just use that as an example. Um, I, I play it. It's it's social. Uh, it's mm -hmm. on if it's a proper pickleball court. It's on like a sport a sport ball kind of a soft surface, so it's not as hard on the joints as something like okay. tennis. Um, so it's 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 fun. There there there's a lot of cross body stuff, which is which mm -hmm. is good. There's agility. So sometimes if people are just walking, uh, you don't get as much of the agility weight transfer stuff going on. Um, right. I, through that as an example, but those would be the, the reasons that I think it's it's good. Is it for everybody? No, because you can't, you are moving back and forth. You know, some people might be able to do it, some people not, but it is fun. It's social. You're getting your heart rate up and you're, and you're practicing some agility. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Amazing. Any other questions either on chat or um, live? Nope. All right. Well, listen, I hope, oh, hold on. Let's see. Susan, congrats on your book. Walking is absolutely essential. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Walking is absolutely essential. That is true. Walking and weight training. <laughs> All right. Listen, have a great, um, great afternoon. Thank you very much for attending and um, we'll see you in six weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.